Uh, welcome and thank you all for participating in this online seminar entitled, So What's Next? The Role of Creative Tourism in the Regeneration of Communities. I'm Nancy Duxbury. I'm a researcher at the Center for Social Studies at the University of Coimbra, Portugal. And I'm principal investigator of Creator, the Creator Project. I'll just say a few words about Creator, about Creator International, and then I will hand it over to our special guest. Uh, Creator is a national uh, research and application project launched in late 2016 that has catalyzed a network of creative tourism initiatives in small cities and rural areas across four regions of continental Portugal, which is currently extending into the Azores archipelago with Creator Azores. Creator's foundation was to link culture, tourism, and local development through collaborative approaches linking research and practice. We found that creative, creative tourism has provided an inspirational perspective to review local resources, cultural, social, natural, etc. It's also provided new pathways for cultural agents and local communities more broadly to interact with visitors and with the tourism sector. And it has shown to be a seed for an array of activities that can lead to place specific and inclusive local development um, strategies and actions. We've also noticed, however, the challenges that come with starts, startups in small places and rural areas and the value of ongoing networking to share experiences, to discuss issues and possible solutions in different contexts to bring together diverse expertise and perspectives and to go forward knowing that you are not alone. During the project, the need to connect with others, not only nationally, but internationally was repeatedly told to us by our partners and participants in the project, as well as those who we met during events, et cetera. This includes individuals and organizations who are researching, practicing, interested in, or developing frameworks to foster community-based cultural and creative tourism. Out of these discussions, Creator, the idea of Creator International was born, which is being defined as an informal network and platform with a twofold focus. First, to net networking, to connect, discuss issues, share, ideas and experiences, and second, capacity building, and to learn from one another. The foundation of Creator International has been to bridge research and practice to foster and inform progressive connections between culture, tourism, and holistic local development. The current time is challenging in so many ways. We have been told it is a time for pause, to reboot, for wide-scale wide disruption and an opportunity for personal and systemic change. Global connectivity has been heightened. Holistic perspectives that overcome sector silos of culture, tourism, and other areas is sorely needed. What we do now, how we think, plan, contemplate the future, and cooperate can have significant impacts in how we go forward. On a closing note, I just need to say some thank yous and then I'll turn it over to our special speakers. Um, first of all, a thank you to our speakers, Greg Richards and Diana Zlaga and our moderator, Kathleen Scherf, as well as Sylvia Silva, our stage manager today. Thank you all for participating and spending your time, choosing to spend your time with us this afternoon. Um, a thank you also to the Center for Social Studies for the platform and assistance in getting us um, going. And to the Creator partners and funder, and our funders, Compete 2020, Por Lisboa, Por Algarve, and the Portuguese Foundation for Science and Technology, without whom Creator would not have been possible. And this ex yeah, grand experiment would not have taken off. So now over to Kathleen. Kathleen Scherf is a professor of communication at Thompson Rivers University in British Columbia, Western Canada. Her current research interests are creative tourism with special attention to resident visitor relations, as well as cultural mapping and the use of digital maps as place making tools. She is also editor of the forthcoming book, Creative Tourism in Smaller Communities 
Place, Culture, and Local Representation coming soon from the University of Calgary Press. So over to you, Kathleen. Okay, thanks, Nancy. Um, well, I'm really happy to be here with everyone and uh, a special hello to at least uh, seven of the authors in the book that uh, Nancy just mentioned. Nice to see you all. I'm the moderator uh, of this webinar and I'm working in partnership with my colleague Sylvia Silva, who is, um, who is the stage manager um, for this session. And so let me introduce our guest speakers. Um, Diana Zualaga um, is a creative tourism entrepreneur from Bogota, Colombia. Um, she has there co-founded Five Bogota, which is a travel with locals um, organization, and it's a it's an award-winning alternative tourism enterprise that connects tourists and residents, and also helps to regenerate uh, local culture. She is passionate about social and collaborative economies and their applicability and their opportunities for creative tourism. She will share her experience both pre and post COVID uh, from her, uh, her tourism enterprise from a rather granular perspective, from a provider's perspective, and she'll talk about where she sees us going next. Our first speaker, though, is Greg Richards, who um, any of you who are interested in placemaking or events or cultural tourism or especially creative tourism will be no stranger to Greg. He's a professor of placemaking at Breda University and also, in case that's not enough, a professor of leisure studies at Tilburg. Greg, however, does not spend his time in a leisurely manner, as his long list of books demonstrates. We have eventful cities, the social impact of events, the handbook of cultural tourism, reinventing the local in tourism, among others, including last year's a research agenda for creative tourism, uh, which he did with our charming hostess, Nancy Duxbury. He serves on the Advisory Council of Creator. His talk today complements Deanna's as he will share um, his bigger picture and contextual views on what's next uh, based on his scholarship and his specific work in many creative cities. So Greg, with much pleasure, I turn it over to you. Thanks, Kathleen, uh, and thanks, Nancy. Uh, it's very uh, pleasing to be invited to this, this forum with so many uh, old friends and new faces as well. I will try and give you a big picture, although, of course, I've got a lot of little pictures in front of me, which is rather frightening. Um, but I'll do my best to give you the big picture on, on creative tourism. I think if we're, if we're talking about creative tourism, we should take a short journey to where we started from and where we might be going to. Um, creative tourism might be linked to the creative turn in tourism and in, in the economy as a whole, uh, which you could link to increasing dissatisfaction with standardised and serial, serially reproduced experiences and the search for distinction among the destinations that, that people go to in, a, in, a, in an increasingly competitive market. So creativity and creative tourism became a way of linking the needs of individual tourists and the places they went to, uh, linking a more active rather than passive role for the tourist with uh, the activation of creative networks in the destination to provide them with more engaging experiences. So some have argued that creative tourism is an extension of cultural tourism and others have argued that it is a, uh, a reaction to the way that cultural tourism has developed, particularly in terms of recent mass cultural tourism, over tourism, whatever you want to call it. And one of the basic reasons for the success of creative tourism, I think, has been the collective relational 
nature of the experiences it provides. People want to get to know places and the people uh, that, uh, that live in them. So it's, it's very much creating relationships between tourists, the places they visit, the people that they encounter, and using creative assets in the destination as a way of bringing those people together. So this is not just a consumption related approach to creativity, a sort of Richard Florida creative class approach, but very much a production related approach to creativity using the creative assets of places to make creative experiences for people. And if we see creativity as a collective endeavour, then it becomes a means of binding local communities, making the places that they live in better. And the point about creative tourism is that it's not only uh, creative engagement for the tourists, but the local community has to become more creative because uh, they need to identify what it is about their place which is special uh, and which is attractive for the people that are, that are visiting. And I think the importance of creativity has also been highlighted by the effects of the, the pandemic. We have limitations on, on travel, which means that people just can't visit places, but we also have limitations on the whole cultural and creative sector as well. So nothing, you know, cultural life in various places has been on hold for uh, a couple of months or more. So the creative sector and tourism are both stopped. And that means that in many cases, people are really missing those things. We miss the ability to travel. We miss the ability to link creatively to other people. Um, there's been a, an enormous run on theater and music performance tickets for those places that have been lucky enough to open up, really underlining that need to connect with people and to engage uh, collectively. And that's the interesting thing about the effects of, of isolation and confinement is that people have found creative ways to connect with each other, whether it's a, a concert from a balcony, a fireman with, uh, uh, with, a, with a, a music performance on a, on a high rise ladder, uh, all of these new ways of thinking about how to do things zoom meetings as as cultural fora as, as new performance podia and so on and this underlines the result resilient and creative spirit that we need to harness if we are going to emerge effectively from the from the pandemic and we should maybe reflect on how uh, other disasters have uh, affected these kind of processes and how people have recovered. There, there are plenty of other examples, maybe not as big as the pandemic, but if you look at things like the effects of earthquakes, so you look at uh, Christchurch in New Zealand, you look at the earthquakes in, in Italy uh, in, uh, in 2015, 2016, then you see that the communities in those areas suddenly became very creative in finding a means to communicate their needs to other people, in bringing the community together and in kickstarting the economy. And what was important in those efforts was the creation of both global and local links. You need the global links to stimulate a flow of resources to the place where you are, which is the same in, in the context of creative tourism. You want people to come and visit you. But at the same time, you need the fine grained local links that stimulate the creative assets that uh, attract people to you in the first place. So there's been a lot of analysis of, of the way in which people have recovered from earthquakes, for example. And we see the importance of cultural and creative events as means of bringing people together around particular issues around uh, tactical uh, place making, for example, what are we going to do with this with this village that has been raised to the ground by an earthquake? Well, you need to talk to people about what their needs are, how they want to redesign things and that kind of stuff. So you need to get people together through events which bring people physically together. And you need to think about themes which interest people. And one of the interesting 
uh, themes, of course, that, uh, that a lot of the events were uh, linked to was gastronomy, because food is a low common denominator and it's also something that people need in the aftermath of a disaster and as a kind of comforting reminder of the importance of culture and community and, and everything else. And in these times as well, we see similar kinds of initiatives emerging, although in new creative ways, such as the Swedish table for one gastronomic experience where you can have as a single diner uh, a table in the middle of a field where you get the, the local ingredients delivered to you in a basket from a farm 50 meters away um, so you're, you're busy eating local ingredients cooked by a local chef uh, but the menu is apparently designed as a way of sending people a warm and slow night in Barcelona since we're unable to travel during these times. So that's creativity. How do we use local food ingredients to give people the idea that they're in Barcelona when they can't get there? And there are, there are countless examples. There, Stalker, for example, uh, comes up with a list of initiatives in Canada um, saying there's nothing like a worldwide pandemic to heighten travel industry creativity. Uh, in my experience, the travel industry itself is not usually very creative, but when they don't have any customers, they start to discover creativity. In all these examples, we see the importance of community engagement as a means of sustaining creativity, creative activities, which in turn sustain tourism activities and therefore the economy. And this underlines two important aspects of creative tourism that will be important in recovering from the crisis. Firstly, anchoring creativity in the local space of places. Creativity is very difficult to sustain in the abstract. It has to mean something to people. So creative tourism needs to follow the principles of creative placemaking, ensure that those local creative resources are given meaning for all stakeholders, visitors, residents, policymakers, businesses, and so on, because that's the only way to, to ensure long-term sustainability. Secondly, they have to link to the global space of flows. So the meaning attached to local creativity should not just be local. It should also mean something to other people who might be willing to travel and share that creativity with you. This is what provides the link with visitors. And it's important to see our own creative resources, not just uh, through our own eyes, but through the eyes of the tourist, because this is also what can make it interesting uh, for us. The things that we see every day, we suddenly realize are also interesting for other people. So ultimately, creative tourism is a system of co-creation between communities embedded in places and the people who visit. So local creative resources can provide new engaging experiences for visitors, but they also support new creative possibilities for local people. And the real transformation lies in the relational encounters that are stimulated by creative tourism. So in the short term, we might have to limit these encounters physically, uh, relying on local tourism, domestic tourism, tourism in your own city, if you like, or tourism in your own region. But we shouldn't forget that many of the participants in creative tourism programs around the world are already local people driven by a curiosity to see the familiar with new eyes. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I, I hope everyone is listening to me. Hi from Bogota, Colombia. Uh, here is quite early. Uh, I mean, it's still morning. And first of all, thank you for inviting me to this space and sharing a little bit about our experience in Colombia. Uh, which is really particular and it is important to mention, not just because it's important for you to, to know where I am geographically, but also because it is important to understand what, what means for the third world this situation and how it, it is way more complicated um, and how we are trying to handle it with the tools we have. So I'm going to try to share with you just a poster that I designed. Let me see. So, 
we are talking about what is next, right? And in our particular case, five Bogota, where, um, as it was mentioned already, what we try to do is connecting scholars with locals through unique experience and creative tourism. And of course, we are, we're having really hard times as everyone in the tourist and travel industry. So what I would like to say is first a little bit of hope and what we are trying to do just to resolve the situation and to keep alive uh, our business, which is really important, of course. So the first thing that I'm going to talk about it is about resilience and how we have been handling this situation and some tips for entrepreneurs or for anyone interested in, in the creative tourism. Uh, then a little bit about how to restart and how to handle the post-crisis, a little bit about like really similar uh, concepts that Greg mentioned already, and then what we have as advantage uh, with as creative tourism agencies or workers or whatever, or the traditional tourism. Um, so let's start with resilience and the practical tips um, that we have been doing to keep alive five Bogota. So um, the first thing I, I would say is that it's really important to um, keep our community connected. So when we said community is not just about our hosts, that of course they are really important and they need to know that we are there and that we're still supporting, but also the whole chain. So let's say we visit a farmer market. So there is a host for the farmer market, but then there, there are too many people um that also are part of our chain as a person that sell the fruit or sell the juice or so how we can support these people during this time so we can actually understand that there is a whole chain that we should be supporting as an agency but also as travelers so there is the other part clients and so how we keep connected with clients letting letting them know that we are having trouble letting them know that we are in hard times and the really interesting thing, and um, what I really like to highlight, is that the travelers for creative tourism, they are part of our community. So they are really happy when they can help somehow through donations, through any way they can support. So it is important to recognize that we need help and it is important to let them out, the community know that we need that help. So for us specifically, it has been working pretty well um so that's one thing that i would recommend to do the other thing would be um something more specific as online lessons or uh podcast so in the, the case of online lessons we have to imagine new products and i think that that's the main problem that we have been facing with that because it's not just translating or or passing from the real and actual experience to an online one. We have to actually design a new product. And of course, that's, that's more complicated and that means more effort. So it is important to understand that we need to create new products. Then uh, another idea that came up is the podcast because basically it helped us to make people traveling during this time so we can actually I don't know, talk about some part of the history of the city, of the place that we are uh, trying to promote or, uh, I don't know, particular things about the culture and things like that. So that could help and just to keep connected. Of course, this is not about business or money or something, but at least to keep connected. And then um, another really important thing would be um, to look for the associated products to our chain. So let's say we work with an artisan. So what they are doing, can we sell these kind of things to our customers so they can support us and they can have something real in their hands uh, or any foods or whatever we can imagine. So it is important to, to like understand if in the whole chain we have something that we can actually share with our clients or with the community, the local community that is also there for supporting us. Um, and of course then, this time is good to, to make the business stronger, a better online campaign or things like that. So it's a good opportunity for that as well. Then uh, trying to talk about the restart or post-crisis. Post I would say, as, as Greg already mentioned, that of course the local market, it's going to be the first one. And in that sense, we have to understand that that's the next step. In our particular case, it's really hard because our main uh, clients are always from other countries. 
So we have to rethink our perks for this local community. And as you can see, what I am thinking about is how to pass from the travel like a local paradigm to the travel like a foreigner one. So how to make people feel foreigners in their own country and even in their hometown. And that's the important thing of the cultural sector. So I think that it's important to create or build a bridge between these two sectors because the cultural sector can give us a lot for the locals and can offer a lot of things that we never imagined before for locals. So let's imagine a big city as Bogota, but any other big city. Um, as soon as you leave the atmosphere, your neighborhood, you are like in another city, in another place, quite different from yours. Even you feel in other city. So what if we imagine someone just going to other area of the city, booking a hotel in that area and trying to experiment how that area is and how you can just feel yourself in other place. So um, that can be really interesting. And for sure, theaters, galleries, museums, shows can be a great thing for these kind of ideas. But then also in the small towns, because of course we are thinking uh, in all the places, the small towns can also recover the, the tourism through the traditions, but not also not always not only the traditions, because I mean, like locals feel like traditions are something that they are not uh, interested or they are not willing to pay that much. But things like pop-ups or workshops, trying to take artisans and giving some workshops about tradition, but with some contemporary touch can be really interesting also for locals. So now our challenge is how to become this experience that used to be for travelers, international travelers, for domestic travelers, and how to make them feel they are actually traveling. So I think that all, of course also travelers are gonna be more willing to, to um, somehow um, be more open for these kind of experiences. Um, but it's still, it's still, it's still a really big challenge. And I think that creative tourism has to be now focused on that specifically for this new restart and how to continue. And finally, the good thing is that we have advantages, a lot of advantages, but I'm going to mention just some because we don't have that much time. Um, the creative tourism nature already consider a lot of things that are needed now up in the post-COVID uh, way of traveling. So the first thing is the sense of community. So what I'm, what I'm saying is that, as I already mentioned, hosts but also travelers are part of this big and strong community. So they are willing to help. They are open to support somehow. So as soon as this is done and we can restart, for sure the community would still be strong and, and the idea of supporting would be there. And that for sure is something really important and it's a big advantage because the traditional tourism have never considered that. People is considered as just someone that go visit a place, come back, sleep, eat, and that's it. Not as a person, as we consider already in the creative tourism. And then the, the sense of one-to-one one, one -one experiences, that it means literally that as we were talking about, it is really important to think, I don't know, like someone going to someone's home, just one-to-one, -one, uh, learning how to cook something or with an artisan, how to do a, an, a handicraft or something like that. So that's already the nature of creative tourism. So we don't have to reinvent ourselves. For sure, the, the traditional tourism has to reinvent themselves to offer things for small groups because they are considered always big groups and big buses and stuff like that. So how to reduce, it's going to be a big challenge for them. And we already have that done. Check as soon as we reopen, we can just start over. And it is really connected with the third advantage that I see that is that we don't need any large infrastructures. So we don't need the mainstreams. We don't need the most places to visit. We just need one person that is open to share some experience with someone else. So in that sense, these are just three of the advantages, but I think that there are too many opportunities because we, are, we were been working uh, for a more sustainable tourism and that's the must right now. It's not an option, it's not something cool to show, it's something that we have to do if we want to keep alive. And that's it, thank you so much.
Um, we're going to hear from Deanna, um, kind of uh, her, her last uh, comments, her observations on after hearing everybody speak. Um, then we'll go to Greg and then Nancy will take us home. So Deanna, over to you. So it, is, it has been really interesting for me to see that actually we are not alone <laughs> and that it's, it's great to keep connected and keep talking about these, these topics because for sure we need more and more ideas and I think like as much as you hear more people, your creativity is also more active. So that's what we need right now. And I would also recommend people to not think that much about the new normal and what it's next and like all these things that are in the end are going to just pull our mind of pessimism and things like that. Like try to keep active right now and try to keep your ideas going on. And I mean, we are here also if someone have any idea and want to share or, or whatever, um, I can also type our website and you can contact us if you see we have uh, something to do, any ideas, or if you would like to be supported by us in any way, we are really open to just try to, to open more these, these kind of spaces of conversation and stuff like that. And then, yeah, try to, to, to take this challenge of the new kind of tourism that invite more locals to travel in their own city, country, region, whatever and try to keep um, alive these ideas because I think for sure uh, that's the first stage and I, I hope it's not that far. So we, we should be ready for that as soon as possible. And so we can start trying to check if this work and how it works. So yeah, more than that, anything else? Thank you so much to everyone for listening, for supporting, and it has been great to be here. Deanna, are you guys in complete lockdown still in Bogota? Yeah, uh, specifically in Bogota, it's supposed to be for at least one more month. Wow. And the problem here is not that many, not, not that much the people, because we don't have that many cases if you compare with the real heart situation. It's more about the health system, healthcare system that can be just... But with this that we have already, that is not that many. It's already like 50% covered. And so we are in a orange alert and things like that. So even though it's not that many people with, uh, with the virus, the thing is that we can, we can control the health system. Curse. So that, that's the problem. So we're still in the lockdown for at least one more month. And the international flights supposed to be open in September, 1st of September. And just yesterday, people can buy, again, international flights. So hopefully, 1st of, of September is going to be the big date. Let's see if that happens. And let's keep hope. <laughs> well, all our best to you and your wonderful organization. And if you would type your website yeah. and your contact info, that would be great. Um, well... Once again, to wrap up, give us his thoughts on, uh, on what has been going on in this conversation um, and in the comments that we've had together. It's my pleasure to call on Greg Richards again. Thanks a lot. Uh, it, it's been great because there's a lot to think about, a lot of creative ideas coming out of it. Um, I'm, I mean, I'm sure as, as, as one of our... Uh, speakers suggested um, there will be a movement away from the city people wanting to get away from the crowds and everything else so I think that's almost that's almost going to happen by default people wanting to escape the virus and, and everything else uh, but the reality of course is is that most people are still going to be traveling through cities through places with with lots of people and that is going to require real creative thought at the moment, one of the problems is that, uh, you know, we, we think about tourism and creativity and culture uh, and safety, all, all as kind of individual silos of, of policy and thinking, and very, very little 
joined up thinking goes on at all. There's, there's very little strategy which, which holistically covers how do we deal with uh, a, a multi-dimensional problem like COVID-19 and restarting tourism in, in very crowded areas. So that's going to be a very big challenge, which is going to require governments to get more creative. Uh, unfortunately, governments don't have much of a record on being creative. And so the suggestions that we've had about people starting from a grassroots level, uh, getting people to think about what they want to do, how they can initiate it, how they can fund it. Uh, Deb's idea about, yeah, let's, let's send the creatives to where the people are, for example. These are things which can be initiated without too much direct thinking by government, which saves them doing it. And I think would probably be a lot more um, uh, effective than wait, sitting around and waiting for, for governments to do things. Um, and we, we've seen in, in the work that we've done uh, with uh, the United Cities and local governments, for example, how difficult it is to, to join up cultural policy and, and tourism policy. But there are some, some very interesting examples of, of what's going on in cities like, uh, like Copenhagen, for example. I saw Kathleen making a comment on, on the local hoods policy there. Um, and in, in the report that we wrote about cultural and tourism policy, you can see a lot more of these kind of ideas of what to do in big cities to get people away from the big cultural attractions like the Sagrada Familia when you don't have COVID-19 to do it for you. No. So that might be uh, some, something that we need to think about a bit more in future. And one of, one of the interesting things that, that uh, was emphasized for me in a webinar that, that I was involved in last week was the fact of uh, how much safety is a question of culture. Because we had people from Asian countries talking about how they were recovering from COVID-19 because of course they, they've been dealing with it a lot longer than, than people in Europe, uh, in, 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 in the Americas, uh, for example. And if you see what's happened there, then you see that because of the way that the culture works uh, in, in places like Hong Kong and Macau, for example, uh, the problems have been much less because governments have reacted quickly. People have done what they've, what they've been told. Uh, and, and so the effects have been, uh, you know, much, much less evident. And it's an interesting debate going forward about the balance between uh, collective responsibility and individual freedom. Because we all, we all like to think, well, I, I have the freedom to do what I like. I want to be able to travel wherever I like and do whatever I like. But in the current circumstances, we can see that individual freedoms can lead to collective problems. And so, you know, the, 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 the balance between the collective and the individual is a very interesting area, uh, which is also important for creative tourism. Thank you, Greg. Um, and I know that we'll, not just me, but everyone will continue to look to you for um, guidance and leadership in your really amazing scholarship. You've been, you've been the person that really shaped this field. So we're thrilled that you were with us today. My pleasure. Ah. Okay, well, I'm delighted uh, to introduce, to close us uh, down and take us into the future, a woman that's a wonderful friend of mine, as, one, as well as a wonderful colleague, Nancy Duxbury, over to you. Thank you, Kathleen, and thank you, everyone. This has been so dynamic. It's been better than our expectations, <laughs> and so it's been fantastic launch of what will hopefully be a lot uh, more events related to Create Tour International. Um, I want to thank, first of all, our speakers, Greg and Diana. Thank you so much for all of your input and ideas and time <laughs> and energies and everything. And for Kathleen, for your energy, the levels and multitasking um, to keep us all going, as well as Sylvia in behind, um, who I know has kept everything together. 
Um, and thank you everyone who's been writing comments and speaking and otherwise um, engaged. It's been fantastic. We are keeping all of these texts and recording as you know. So um, online afterward, we will be able to post the presentations of the speakers, but not the discussion because we need special permission for that. But what we'll try to do is um, create a short synthesis or something to document the ideas that have been um, put forward um, so that there's some more permanent um, record of that. And I just, on that note, I wanted to really state how restate how wonderful this has been to be a launch of this idea, um, which is now becoming more realized, of Creator International as a network and a platform um, primarily oriented toward networking, conversations, learning together, not being so lonely, realizing you're not in this alone. And this might be the perfect moment to really be launching this. Um, as, and, and also um, looking at capacity building, asking each other for expertise, for suggestions, for experiences, um, researchers, practitioners, others, whoever has ideas. Um, it has not been designed, however, or envisioned as a sales platform. However, this is one of those emerging ideas and it's based um, this is our first online event we're going to try to have something in mid mid July so not to leave you alone for too long and then in fall in some sort of regular um, activity but we also have a, a website under development a listserv and what create tour international will do is actually dependent on who's involved and so we really want to make this a collective exercise so that um, it can be a platform to help with the big, to address the needs that are out there for connecting, um, for learning and for building your capacity and develop partnerships perhaps among groups of members that maybe want to create a sales platform or a central platform um, if that's what you wish to do. So, um, First of all, um, ideas for other activities, connections, needs, anything you have to say that you would like to communicate after this closes, um, please email createur at sej.uc.pt. Um, Kathleen, can you type that in? It's the yeah. Creator address, or Sylvia, the Creator address um, in general. Well, thanks, Tiago. Tiago did it. Uh, there, Tiago has done it. Um, and we can collect and we, we like to network and we will keep um, names and emails and all of that. Um, secondly, I wanted to just uh, point out two uh, small initiatives that are under three actually um, underway currently, which hopefully you will see the life of, see shortly. Um, one is a book being produced, a number of the authors are in the audience. Um, produced on creative tourism to be published by Cabby International with the primary audience to be um, is envisioned to be practitioners, local agencies that want to develop creative tourism, people who want to get involved with a lot of wonderful advice that has been written into articles based on experiences um, of developing and maintaining and, um, and uh, sustaining creative tourism organizations and also from researchers with advice that has come out of research, including Diana is one of our, our authors and Greg. Um, so that should be out early 2021. It's the type of book that we would have loved to have at the beginning of Creator and didn't exist. So now we're trying to pull together advice as we can um, from those we meet on the way. Um, two other documents which are to be seen publicly more, more uh, quickly. One is a policy recommendations document that we're creating out of Creator for Portugal, looking at specifically what we think um, is needed to sustain a creative tourism network, particularly focused on smaller places and rural areas. Um, but we hope as well that some of the, some of the um, learnings in there are applicable to other places as well. 
Um, and the, se uh, the second smaller document that's being um, translated and designed very shortly is a practitioner's document, um, a, re a shorter doc uh, report on create, or not report, publication on creative tourism for people in the creative sector, cultural sector, or tourism that have heard of creative tourism and are wondering what they have to, what advice we might have to give them, um, how to go forward tips based on um, the experiences of Create Tour and in particular, the experiences of our 40 pilots across the country, some of which are in the audience there today, um, who have um, been um, undertaking the hard work of making these, uh, making ideas real in challenging, such, in challenging times without the government structures that one always hopes for. So um, there are a number of things going forward. Creator International is one of those ideas um, that one hope with collaboration with those of you who are really interested in this idea, um, please get in touch and we will collectively envision what this could be. Thank you all for being here today. Now let's, we're already over time, I think. So I will let you head off. Three minutes, but we oh, three minutes. right okay. on time. Tiago <laughs> uh, has just posted uh, the documentary that- uh, oh, Thank you, for that. And it's so good. I showed it to uh, my travel class and my travel media class and they loved it. So um, I, I recommend you all watch that. And uh, one more. I just noticed yeah. there's an, an oh, let's see me. Mo from Japan is on here. Um, there's a number of people I, in the audience from the Azores, and I mentioned at the beginning that we are still in the process of working on Creator Azores as an offshoot in addition to the mainland based Creator project um, as part of the Creator Azores project. There will be a well. There was envisioned a large conference at some point in late 2021 or early 2022. By then we will figure out how this can happen and how it can be a hybrid something online and in person to um, hopefully continue this, this other dimension. Um, so there is a face-to-face -face plan in the future. But uh, for now, we'll just try to keep you all connected and extend the connections online. Bye everyone.